CJ here with the Thrive Team, where we are passionate about keeping leaders healthy and churches thriving. We have a Thrive Conference coming up May 3rd through the 6th. If you know nothing about it, we've got a link in the description. Check it out. Bring your team. It's going to be an incredible time of inspiration, training, and, and just networking. So uh, be there. Now, Phil Jackson, the coach of the Chicago Bulls, said something really interesting. He said the hardest part of his job was always when they won a championship. He said because the following year, his entire team would come and they all thought as individuals, they were the individual reason why they won. Each player thought we won because of me. In this video with Carlos Whitaker, an amazing communicator and author, he talks about how we can guard ourselves during those seasons where we're on the up or we're experiencing a ton of success. Let's check this out. When, when things are that good in your life, we kind of start walking around with a little bit of a swagger, right? Like just a little bit of like, like, man, look at me. Look what I am doing. Look how good God is. And, and if we're not careful in those seasons, we can begin to take the glory away from God. And, and, and the reason why I want to heed a warning to anyone that's in a sweet season is because it's so this is when the enemy is going to come in. This is when warfare begins. Because um, he's going to come in and start lying to you and uh, allow you to believe that it is you and your gift set that is bringing the abundance and the blessing in your life. And why that's dangerous is because when we start to believe that, it get, things get shady. And, you know, here I was, things were going great. I'm winning trophies for making my son cry. I'm like doing all kinds of, like, this is crazy, God. I can't do anything wrong. And inevitably what started happening for me, and this is where the warfare began, was I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm living in the light of his goodness, but I looked over at darkness. And over here, darkness looked pretty appetizing. I, nobody can tell you that darkness does not look appetizing. Okay, I don't care what, who you are, how holy you, you feel, that stuff looks good. Especially, it, it, it's enticing. So I'll never forget the first day I just stuck my toe over into darkness. And then I was like, hey, nobody found out. That was cool. Like, like, and look, everything's still going great. My family's great. I wonder if I could do that again. So then the next day, just dip my toe in a little bit longer and then back out. And I was like, things are still going good. I'm still singing to thousands of people on a weekly basis. It's amazing. And the danger is we begin to feel like we can dance between light and dark. But the truth is, you, you, you can't. You can't dance. And this is where, this is the, the, the most important space that so many people are in. We all know, we all have this thing over here, this dark thing over here that we really, or it looks very appetizing. But when we start dancing, the dancing will inevitably lead to drowning. And for me, let me, let me I'm just going to tell you my story really quickly. Um, I'll, I'll never forget, I was, I was dancing between light and dark for a few months. And then one day, um, my we were living in a small condo in Nashville and my kids were really little at the time. And my, uh, my wife was cooking dinner. It smelled amazing. And I, I w went to the front and to ask what was for dinner because it smelled so good. And, and I'll never forget, like she wasn't in the kitchen and the, the pot was still boiling. And um, I was like, hey, babe, what's for dinner? Like this smells amazing. And she wasn't anywhere. And I remember my heart started to beat because when you're in, when you're dancing between light and dark, you're always looking out. You're always trying to feel like, does anybody, does anybody know? Like you just know. And I just knew in that moment, I was like, so I sprinted around the corner to grab my laptop and it was gone. And then I sprinted out to the driveway and the minivan was gone. And I knew in that moment that I was no longer dancing. I was drowning and I was caught in the middle of, I was about to enter the darkest season of my life uh, where I was going to have to make a decision whether or not to enter into warfare or just give up and give in. So, you know, I, I run back to the, to the bedroom and I put my little kids at the time on the, on the sofa and just with tears in my eyes, I'm like, daddy has made a big mistake. And I don't know what's about to happen, but I need to look at you and I need to tell you I'm sorry and I'm gonna try to fix things. And here I am like trying to give this speech to my kids that don't even know what I'm talking about. They see their dad crying, there's a knock on the door and it's my best friend, Blake, and his wife, Allie. And uh, they said, Heather knows everything. Uh, your secret's out. 
and uh, she wants the kids, and she wants you out. And so began the darkest season of my life. Um, I, I moved in with uh, my friend Blake and his family, and I was so angry at God. Um, I, 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 was, I was, like, you know, people maybe could wonder, like, why would you be angry? You're the one that did this. But the truth is, like, none of us want to do these things. No one's like, I want to ruin my life today. I want to destroy my family. I want to make decisions that are going to mess my kids up. No, no, nobody. I was actually listening to all the podcasts. I was going to church every week. I was leading worship every week. I was begging God to help me stop sinning. But, but what I didn't realize is that I was trying to stop with my own strength. I was trying to do all the warfare on my own. I was striving. And I, I quickly realized that my, my freedom wasn't going to be found in striving. It was going to be found in surrender. And so uh, I, I did. I, I was at Blake's house. This is like month three now. I haven't talked to my wife. Divorce papers are, are filed. Um, things are, the family's over. Um, and I was, I was shaking my fist at God. Um, and I got a text from a friend of mine. And uh, it was a, a Bible verse. It was just one verse. And I think we've got the scripture, 1 Peter. And it said, For the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will personally restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. Now, if if there was a period after support you, that'd be the greatest scripture in the Bible. Man, that's awesome. Oh, it's sweet. I got a God of all grace who's going to personally restore, establish, strengthen, and support me. Yes, But unfortunately, there's three dots because there's more, right? It says, after you have what? Suffered. Oh, so you're telling me that this Christian walk thing, there's going to be suffering involved? Now, if there was a period after suffered, it'd be a whole other Bible verse too. But fortunately, there's two more words. And what are they? A little. So here I sat in the home of my best friend, Blake, and his family, without my family, I've ruined my life, and I'm reading the scripture as if it is, it's, it felt like God was mocking me, because I'm like, a little God? It, this does not feel like a little. You're, you're telling me, but I just felt in the moment, God was like, your suffering may feel like a lot right now, but I promise you, I promise you, My love is going to overflow and bring you out on the other side to where this moment is going to feel like a little. 